I've been thinking about this, about the fact that we're, we are on a journey at the moment and we're moving, we're transitioning from one thing into another, yeah? And so we don't really know what, what it's looking like other than the fact we'll have a congregational pastor, we'll have more involvement in family and domestic violence um, support work, um, we'll be expanding the stuff that's going on in ER. I don't know if Vicky was aware. But anyway, all this stuff just keeps growing. And so, um, but we're moving and, and, and sort of things are changing. But what I want to make sure is that we make sure we pack and keep our essentials, yeah? We don't leave anything behind in the journey. So that made me think, okay, so what, what is it that we need to be taking with us? What is it about us? What makes Christie's Beach us, yeah? And what do we need to make sure that in the move we don't lose, what makes us us? What's important to us? Have a think about that. I'll give you the few that you probably should be, I hope you can say off the top of your heads by now. So um, first up, of course, there's John 17, which is the passage where Jesus is speaking about the unity that is in within Father, Son and Holy Spirit. They're all coming together and they are one God and they're completely united. And then he says this absolutely amazing thing where he actually mirrors it and says, and Lord, what I'm asking, so this is Jesus praying for us. And he says, Father, what I'm asking is that unity that we have where we're absolutely committed completely and utterly to one another, that that be the, the mark of being a Christian. That the people in, so let's bring it down to us, the people at Christie's Beach Baptist Church will be united as one person, one, um, one family, yeah? Not person, family. And there will be that love, and the love that's between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is the love they'll have for each other, and the way that they will act will just show everyone that one, they're united, two, they love one another, and three, they can love one another, even though they're incredibly difficult to love. <laughs> so let me just read that scripture. I pray, this is Jesus speaking, he says, I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. In other words, he's praying for us right now, okay? That's what he's saying. He's saying, Father, I'm praying that all of them may be one Father, just as you and I, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be ones at one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. So that idea of we're going to love one another, okay? The other, that's going to be one of our backpacks that I don't mind us carrying, yeah? So another one of our backpacks that we need to be carrying is this thing called Mind the Gap. And so it's this idea of if you say that you believe something in the Bible, you actually live it and do it. And if you don't live it and do it, stop saying that you believe it because you're a hypocrite, yeah? So if you say that the Bible says that Christians pray and you do not pray... That's hypocritical, okay? So stop it. If you say that, it's pretty clear, isn't it? <laughs> Any questions so far? Good. Um, if you say that you believe the scriptures, okay, well, actually, we'll come to that one in a minute. Um, so the mind the gap between what you say you believe and what you do. And if you've got a gap, you do something about it. Either stop saying it or start doing it, Yeah. So that's another backpack that, you know, we don't mind carrying. The next one is going to be the fact that we are a church of all sorts. And that's where we're back again to this idea of being un united. We are not all the same, thank God, and we're not supposed to be. Except that what happens in churches, in my very humble opinion, and you all know how humble that is, um, <laughs> is that what we do is we tend to gather around people who think like us act like us, believe the same things as we do. I mean, what on earth would happen if we had a church full of different theologies? Oh, 
shock, horror. You know, you're supposed to have different theologies. You're supposed to see God different because you are different and we're supposed to celebrate difference. And what we're not supposed to do is have us all as a monoculture, this idea that we all have to believe the same things and do the same things, okay? The more diverse, it should be that when you get someone in the church and there's different people in the church who believe stuff different to you, you think, thank God. You know, we're doing what we said we would do. We're a church of all sorts. They don't see God the same way as I do. I don't agree with them, but, you know, we can see the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control in that person. So God's definitely at work in them. You can't be that love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control. You can only do those things when you've got God helping you, yeah? Right. So that's what we're looking for, what we're not looking for. Do you think I feel quite passionate about this? Yeah, it comes across, doesn't it? I really do. I think it's not about the theological perspective. It's about if we can see the fruits of the Spirit in people. That's the thing I'm looking for. I'm looking for character, not gifting, not belief thing. And I want people to disagree with me, you know? Thank you. (laughs) So, and even more so... The reason I think I'm so passionate about this church of all sorts is because at the moment in the world, not even in a moment, for this last season, have you noticed how polarizing everything is? You're either for or against something, yeah? There's no grey, is there? So you're either for vaccines or you're against them and you're going to hell on either side, whatever you believe, yeah? Yeah? There's this absolute polar, and that's just one of the things. My gosh, let's not get started. And I've stopped doing Facebook completely. It's doing my head in. Um, We're forced to take sides over theology. And again, something that's happening a lot, I think, in um, social media. I believe this. Well, I believe this. Great. Because somewhere in both of your things is God. Yeah? You don't. You don't have ownership and rights on God's, and you can't make God in your own image, although people do. Um, So, and I've seen that, that thing of like polarizing over theological positions, you know. And the other thing is, to be honest, church, I've noticed it creeping in here. I've noticed this thing where people are saying, well, I believe this. Do you know that, you know, well, pick on me because um, I'm, here okay but you know do you know what Julie believes you know oh there you go sometimes I didn't even know that I believe that so and I've just noticed this thing creeping in I've noticed this thing creeping in with gossip where it's just like have you heard about it's not quite done like that we wouldn't do that because we're nice but it's just got that edge do you have any idea what I'm talking about You're all looking at me as if you've got no idea. (laughs) But that thing that people do that just goes, you know about them, don't you? The other. Yeah, the other. Um, There's that thing of gossip or complaining. Either complaining, leadership, oh, do you know what the leadership have done? Do you know what the oversight team's done? Do you know what Julie's done? Just so you know, I probably did. Um, whatever the thing is, it's, but it polarises us, yeah? Are you, are you going to be on my side as I complain about what, you know, Julie's done? Or are you going to have to go onto this side and defend me? By the way, I probably don't need defending. Like I said, I probably did do it. So, Yeah. And it's that thing, and it's subtle. Oh, it's a, it's a subtle little sneaky. What is it about foxes who come in and steal your fruit and grapes? This little thing that comes in, nip, 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 nip. And it's actually taken away from my backpack of the, some one of the things that's our values that we actually do think differently. We are, we are odd. There are people in the church that I don't like. Oh, um, you know. It's just people that you just have to work at. That's brilliant. That's awesome. That's something we celebrate. So if you get that thing of like, um, you know, oh, she believes this. Yay. So I know, isn't it awesome? I don't agree with her at all. 
It's so great because we're a church of all sorts, all right? So watch out for it, particularly because it's the spirit on the world. And we do not conform to the pattern of this world, but we are transformed by the renewing of your mind. So change your mind on this and celebrate difference, even if they don't agree with you, particularly when they don't agree with you theologically. All right, so what have we got? We're getting through. Are you keeping up? One of the things, so let me come back, to just putting all of those things together, just as like a recap. So, actually, what I think I'm saying is we've got a mind the gap moment actually happening in church right now, right? Because what we say we believe is John 17 and the fact that we are united together in Christ as the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit are united, we are as a church, okay? That's what we say we believe. John 17, and you're every week, every time he says it, you know, he being Daniel, hello, love, sorry. Um, every time Daniel says it, it's like, yeah, we believe that. You know what she's like, don't you? You know, uh, if I were you, I, I just wouldn't have it. Well, in fact, I wouldn't have around. Is anyone noticing a little bit of a mind the gap moment? And yet we say we're a church of all sorts. We say we believe this. So what I'm saying is these um, backpacks are the things that we need to actually work really hard um, um, to, to keep an eye on, particularly in this season. And I, I'm not saying... Because I know that some of you are going to be sitting there and saying, oh, what about heresy? Oh, I know. Um, but just what about the times when someone says, "You honestly, honestly, okay, I've been a pastor now for a long time. It's because I'm a grandmother. <laughs> um, two weeks. Um, so I've been a pastor a long time, okay? I cannot... I'm pretty sure now I'm now at the stage where I can't be shocked anymore at the things that people tell me that they believe or that they think about God and everything. And so I've heard it before. And yes, I've heard heresy and I've heard it in this church. Okay, where you just think, oh, okay. I don't even know, I can't even think of a scripture that goes with that, you know? So I'm not saying that it's not difficult when someone says something and you think, oh, that's outside of my thinking, yeah? And are we sure about that? And everything's, I am not saying that we just go, oh, that's nice. Yeah, we all believe everything here. I'm not saying that, okay? I'm not asking you to change your mind over your theology. Well, actually, sometimes I am, okay, when it's heresy. And, we, you know, we sort of talk about it for a while. But most of the time, we don't do that. What we do is listen to what the other person has to say, but I don't have to agree with them, okay? I just listen to what they have to say, and we, we work it out as a journey. And I really try, I really do try, to understand what it is they're telling me. I don't listen so I can form an argument to tell them why they're wrong, Okay? That is not listening. That's a mind the gap moment, okay? If I'm going to say I am a church of all sorts, then I will learn and understand what it is the outworking of being a church of all sorts here is that I deliberately choose to listen to what people say and understand where they're coming from. And I try really hard to get it, what it is they're saying, okay? And sometimes I go, oh, I get it. You know, I still, I, I still don't, but I get where you're coming from. I'd really try. And that's what I'm talking about in this space. So I'm not saying that it's not difficult to live in unity when you fundamentally disagree with something that's particularly if it's a value to you. It's not easy. I'm not saying that it is. So how do we do that? How do we live with someone we think, I so don't agree with you on that. What's the answer? Well, actually, it's another one of our backpacks, and it's this thing of liminality. Great word. What it means is the space of betwixt and between. It's the place of grey in a black and white polarising world. It's the space of going, oh, OK, that's a different understanding. Let me, let, I'll, I'll move into the grey here. I'll let you explain that to me. 
Okay. Um, the trouble, though, with us is that for most of us, we're evangelicals. I think we've got that sort of background. And the problem for us as evangelicals is that um, we've been taught to have very black and white thinking about God. We believe this, we hold it by faith, and we've got, we've got this thing that, um, you know, you hold on to what God has told you and what he is like, okay, what you, are the teachings of the church and the stuff you've grown up with, we hold on to them. And if we question them, well, then we lack faith in God or we're letting him down or we're going to burn in hell. I don't know, it depends how far up and down the spectrum you are. So I don't know what you respond. We feel guilty, okay? We feel guilty um, when we're struggling with uncertainty and we're questioning our faith and we're questioning if God even exists or we're asking ourselves why questions. We feel like we're letting God down in that space, like we shouldn't do that. The other thing is we feel really guilty if we start to look at things that we believe and start tearing them apart, deconstructing it's called. You deconstruct stuff you, you believe and you feel really guilty. Like, again, oh my gosh, I'm arguing with the church and again, I'm going to go to hell. You're really not, church. It's called Christian faith. And actually, if you look at the Bible and the stories of the people in the Bible, you notice they go on this thing called journey and wilderness and a thing they call the pit and the grave. Yay, that's a great place to be living in, isn't it? You know, a, a, a place of lament where you're asking why God questions. That's all part of your faith. That's that place where you don't know what you believe. What place where you think, God, I believe this, but my experience is this, and it's just not working, yeah? The questions and everything else, it's Christianity. That is your faith. If you've got everything sewn up, I, w- I want to question. Can I question if you're saved? No, but you know, I, like, where's your relationship? Shouldn't you just be growing and changing? Shouldn't... Iron sharpen iron. Shouldn't there be people in the church who make you think differently and then make you work out what you do think? That, you know, that's your faith. So this backpack of liminality, this backpack of moving us all into a space where we can learn to think in grey and not absolutes and black and whites. Okay, that's one of the ones. And I I want us to be a people who are actually excited when we're feeling uncomfortable in our faith. Yeah? When you're thinking, I don't know the answer, God help me, and I don't like this, and I wish we didn't have to go through this. But isn't it exciting to have to think differently? You all look so excited. (laughs) Oh, it's the masks. Listen, mate, I've got good at looking into your eyes. All right, liminality. All right, I've got two more backpacks. We're only going to do one for you today. This one I will do next time I preach. Um, Be a prophetic church because I guarantee you're not thinking what I am. So we'll do that one as a whole sermon. But the next one, okay, is from this psalm, which is Psalm 68. Okay, and it says, sing to God, sing in praise of his name. Extol him who rides on the clouds. Rejoice before him. His name is the Lord. Now, before we, excuse me, move on. This comes from drinking too much water. What do you think when you hear that part of the scripture? What do you think about God? Doesn't it? Yeah? Do you start thinking things like victory and overcoming? God is for you, not against you. Do you read things like this and start thinking, this is my God and my God is for me? Those kind of things. Yeah, it's great, isn't it? Um, But in the psalm, this psalm, this is the first psalm, it's going to go on to the next part. And in it, um, it says, so this part's telling us who God is. And then he's going to tell us, the psalmist can tell us what God does, okay? And in that space, when you felt your own spirit rising, that was your response, yeah? To, to what the psalm does. And immediately, I hope, 
that you thought and remembered what God can do for you and how he's for you and the prayers that you've got and the victory you'd like to see and that thing of, of it happening for you. And that's the right response. But it is not the response the psalmist had. Okay, have a look at this. So he tells you this is God and then he says, this is the God who is a father of the fatherless. A defender of widows is God in his holy dwelling. God sets the lonely in families. He leads out the prisoners with singing, singing, but the rebellious live in a sun-scorched land. And so one of the things about this psalm is that that's different often from the way we are as church, particularly Western church. As Joyce was praying this morning, we're pretty comfortable, yeah? And we're very used to, we are trained um, to actually spend the grace of God on ourselves, yeah? Whereas what this psalm says is that from the revelation that you have of who God is, you immediately start, immediately start thinking about others and not yourself, okay? Do you see that? It's quite a big difference, hey? That the first thing, that when because imagine writing this, you're writing who God is and you're getting so excited and you just... And you know this is the God who is for you. That's a message. That's the psalm. And not just that. This is about a message for people who didn't know they could be a part of this. Hey? This is for those who don't have a voice, who've got no power, who've got... By power, I mean the... What do I mean... Do you know that thing where you, you, with, even within yourself, you know you've got certain rights and certain bits that you can pull up and go, oh, hang on a minute, you've got self-confidence even in that space. These, these people who are listed here of people who've got no confidence left in themselves, in other people, in the system, they have got nothing, okay? And into that space, God says, this is your God, and this is the message I have for you about this God. So, um, immediately, um, the psalmist um, it gets you to think about people who don't have a support group, and, um, and they're saying, fight for them. Have a voice for those who don't have a support group. Um, so... Um, for this psalm, actually, which is quite a long psalm, I sort of do it in shorthand, and I use that one verse, which said, God sets the lonely in families. That's my like, shorthand prayer for praying the whole sort of um, verse. Um, um, so that thing of actually seeing that God would use that, um, Christie's Beach Baptist Church as a place where we can put lonely people into families and groups or a place where lonely, the lonely feel like they belong, they're welcomed, they can come in and join or we've actually gone out and put our arms around them and drawn them in. It's both, isn't it? It's both and. Um, so now there's a pastoral care group that um, runs with a few of us. So there's myself, there's Anne who's waving, there's Rob Jacobs who's not here, he's one of the ones gallivant in a way. Um, Tom, smile and wave. So, um, Sue, smile and wave. Um, so it's a group of us and we meet together and we pray and we we do all this stuff. Um, we primarily focus on the people who are not in groups, okay? That's, our, that's my job. As pastor, I see that as my role and responsibility to look out for the people who can't look out for themselves, who aren't in groups, or lives have become such that they're just falling out of the edges. They're the ones that I focus on, okay? Um, because, and the reason why I don't focus on you lot if you're, when you're in groups and everything is because I think the scriptures are very clear, okay? The pastor is not the pastoral care, okay? In fact, Daniel, as you know, won't even be called pastor because he started the I pastorally don't care group. So we have to notice our giftings. The call of you have learnt and you're doing better. Well done. So scripture is clear, okay, that pastor... Hey? 
failure. It does set you up for failure, you're right. So you, and you try so hard, don't you? So anyway, we're not doing that. We're not doing marriage guidance and um, counselling, are we? So no. Pastoral care, was, I'm pretty sure, I know, that the scriptures say that pastoral care is your responsibility as the body of Christ. You are responsible for the pastoral care. Okay? And you're responsible on two levels. The first is to put yourself into a group. So you've got people who are looking out for you. You are Christians, and a lot of you have been Christians a lot of years, okay? Do you remember what Tani was saying about grow up? I think this is one of the areas, hey, grow up. Put yourself into a group where you can actually have a group around you who you can share with, who you can say, hey, can you pray for me in this area? I'm going to need a bit more press support. I need some help in this. So put yourself into a group with people who can look out for you. But the second thing is, I'm, I'm not expecting you all to have, you know, be aware of everything and everyone has gone on in church. But in that group, you're the pastoral care. So the second level of responsibility is that you're responsible for the people in your group, yeah? That you are looking out for them, that you are praying for them. If something's going on in their life and world, that you're giving them a ring and all of that sort of stuff, yeah? So, and you're checking up. And why? Because that's the Christian faith. So, And I am convinced that in this area, we will have to answer to the Lord on Judgment Day. And I don't like, sort of like, Behave yourself, because otherwise you're going to hell. I don't like that kind of like um, teaching. But actually on this one, I think the scripture is really, really clear. The Lord is going to say to us, who did you clothe? Who did you feed? Who did you support? Who did you go and visit? Who? who? And then as you're standing there with him, and you look out over all the people in Christie's Beach, just in the church here, the Lord's going to say, who did you do that for? Yeah? And that's where you can turn around and say, oh, well, we did, actually did an awesome job because we were actually listening when Julie preached. Yeah. Okay. Um, when did you feed me? So this attitude of, I know Jesus, so what can I do for you? That, you know, I know Jesus, let's put the lonely in the family, um, is one of the back backpacks that I want us to have. But this verse, it's about a lot more than that. I've been praying this now for eight years, particularly this God sets the lonely um, into a family. And I've got to tell you, at the moment, it's really difficult. It is a mind the gap moment because COVID has left a lot of us thinking, I can't be bothered going to church and meeting everyone. I don't want to invite anyone round. I just don't want to invite them round for coffee. It's just too much effort. Um, I don't want to go out. I don't want to be involved in group. Or I don't want to go in, get involved in the groups that I was even in. And I'm not the only one who is feeling this. And the church isn't the only organisation where uh, seeing that people just don't want to meet together after COVID. This is happening in um, secular and in religious organisations right across. So there's a massive drop in community engagement. And so encouraging and working to see God put the lonely in families when people don't want to meet is really difficult, okay? But we just keep praying and we just keep working at it and we will break through this, okay? And if you're thinking right now, well, I'm lonely and I'm not in a family, then speak to Sue and Neil who are waving, there you go. And they'll talk to you about what groups. There's all sorts of stuff. There's life groups. There's FFF. If you don't know what that is, that's a meal and you can speak to Sue and Neil. Um, there's ER. You can join in that team and be a part of um, working into the community. You could work in the play group. Find a place where week in, week out, you're boringly doing the job of making a friend. Or did you think that friends just magically appeared? Yeah? No, you've got to work at it. God puts the lonely in the families. And so, but for me, it's one stage more. I'm also, and I start with myself, I don't do this thing of, I do eventually, but I don't do this thing of, well, the church should be. I start with, what will I do about this? And, and then I say, hey, guess what, church? We're doing this. Um, but I'm trying to work out 
Um, so I spend my time thinking about things like, God, where are you trying to put the lonely, gay, lesbian, um, trans, Christian brothers and sisters that we've got out there? How, how will we put those lonely people into this church? Okay. And so I spend my time thinking about that. I, I'm putting the lonely into the family um, to do m m with wi um, women and families who are in domestic abuse situations where their relationships are really stressful and, and controlling. I spend my time praying, thinking, God, how will we put that lonely those lonely women into this family. Now, it's God who does it, but we cooperate, yeah? We're his hands and feet. So that's another one of the backpacks, all the time thinking, Lord, how will we create and make sure there is space for all sorts that, we've, um, that we're holding on to the scripture of you put the lonely into families, that's going to mean we're going to have some difficult theological places, so we're going to have some real mind the gap moments where we're just like, well, I believe this and you believe that. How, how will we do that? But these are all the backpacks that I want us to carry. So this is my recap for you. All right. Um, these are ours, the ones that I think we should be carrying. Liminality, that greyness, that ability to journey and not have the answers. Mind the gap between what we say we believe and we do so we're not hypocrites. Working to keep the unity of the spirit. Welcoming, God welcomes all sorts, so will the church even if it kills us. God puts the lonely into the family and next time I'll talk about being a prophetic church. Now, they're my backpacks, right? So now I'm the mum again, okay? If you take it, you've got to carry it. So what are you carrying, church, as we journey through? Yeah? Let's stand.